the devil and spiritual warfare, and, and it can seem somewhat out of pocket. Uh, but, but hear this. I said this a couple of weeks ago, uh, that the theme of Ephesians is this, that God in Christ is bringing all things together. Uh, let me read from the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 1. H- here's what it says in verse 10. It says, the plan is, is this, is to bring everything together in Christ, both things in heaven and things on earth in him. That God is, is uniting all things in Christ, in his son, Jesus Christ. And, and so we see that as we unpack the book of Ephesians. Uh, we see that, that we are being unified to God through Jesus in, uh, in our own salvation. Uh, and then we see that he's bringing people from all walks of life to be unif- unified in Christ, right? The transcultural church. And, and then that kind of bleeds out into what that looks like and how we function and how we have different gifts. But all of those are meant to work together in unity, And then he talks about marriage and the union of that and how it points to Christ and the church. He talks about how we're supposed to be unified in our families and in our workplaces, all of this in Christ. But he turns a corner because he then says, listen, while you're maintaining the unity that comes in the gospel, there is one who seeks to divide that. And you need to be aware of him. Because he is, I mean, he is crafty. He, he, in many ways, and we'll see it now, knows you better than you know you. And so beware. Beware. And so he finds it necessary to unpack what it is that we need to make sure that we don't allow the evil one, the devil, to break up the unity that is made possible because of the gospel. And so if you have a Bible, meet me in the book of Ephesians chapter 6, I'm going to start from verse 10, and we're going to make our way through it. Here's how Paul begins this portion. He says, finally, be strengthened by the Lord and by his vast strength. I love that. The New Living Translation says it this way. A final word. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. It's like he gives it to us twice in case you missed it the first time. Right? Be, be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. This is, this is a command. It's a strong word of encouragement. He, he's saying to us that, that we must become capable in the mighty sovereignty of God. That's the call. In many ways, that we should have the same spirit that Caleb had in Numbers chapter 13, verse 30. This is when the the Israelites have made their way out of Egypt. They're going to the promised land. In fact, they are moments away from all that God has promised them. And so Moses sends a few spies just to go take a look at the land to make sure that, hey, everything is, is good and to make sure we have everything that we need to go in and take the land. They come back with a report Ten of them are like, man, uh, look, we can't do this. As amazing as it was, we can't do this because, I mean, the the land is is fortified, it's protected, uh, it's armored, it's it's full of powerful people who are described as giants. But two of them, so no, 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 don't believe those ten guys. Hey, we, we can do this. In fact, Caleb says, we are well able to overcome it. We are well able to overcome it. Come it. And so that's kind of where Paul begins. He says, listen, I, I want you to say, have the same spirit that Caleb had to be able to, to stand firm, to be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. We have to. We have to access the power of God. Verse 11, put on the full armor of God so that you can stand against the schemes of the devil. Here we go. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this darkness, against evil, spiritual forces in the heavens, right out the gates. Paul the Apostle is telling us something very, very important. And so don't miss it. Because so many of us do. Don't miss it. Right out the gates. Paul lays it on the table and he goes, I want you to know that there is a battle. There is a battle. Now, I know some of you might go, well, oh, no, I feel like that's quite obvious. It's not as obvious as it seems. And, and, and you don't have to look too far because there's so many Christians who live life as if there's no battle. And Paul goes, no, 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 there is a battle. And it's a supernatural one. It is a supernatural one. Our, 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 our battle is not against flesh and blood. Now, I know you might go, oh, no, I, I, I would disagree. 
me and my neighbor have had some words, right? I've got issues with my colleague, family members. Like, I get that. I get that. And I'm not saying that that's not important. But what Paul is, is doing here is he, he's getting us to see beyond the physical. That there are evil spirits beyond the physical. We are in a battle, friends. And it is a supernatural one that has natural and physical implications. But its origins are supernatural. And this battle is being led by Satan himself. And Satan is not just a cartoon character that we got to enjoy as kids who's red and got some horns and a tail. No, 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 friends. He is, he is real. And he's the one that is leading this battle that is against the kingdom of God. Satan is the leader. R you'd remember this in Ephesians chapter 2. Where Paul says, you used to live in sin, just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. That's who leads this battle against the kingdom of God, against the children of God. And so we need to understand the battle. We need to know who the commander is, who leads this army that is against us. Now, I'm going to try to do that. And while this may not be an extensive study of Satan, I hope that you would do that in your own time and in, uh, in your family group and in your discipleship group. My hope this morning is to give you a little bit of who he is and what he's about so that we can stand. We can stand against his schemes. And so a little bit about who the devil is because the Bible is unbelievably clear. We don't have to go to... to, to these weird places that sometimes we'll find ourselves in trying to figure out who are the evil spirits and who's leading them. No, no, no. The Bible is very clear. Very clear in its explanation of who the devil is. The devil, the Greek word diabolos, means the, the slanderer, the liar, the, the adversary. Sometimes referred to as Satan, Satanas, meaning the enemy. And that is who he is. He is not a friend. He is your enemy. For the children of God, He is your enemy. Now, the Bible defines the devil as an angelic being who fell from his position in heaven due to sin and is now completely opposed to God, doing all in his power to stop God's plans and purposes. Satan was created as a holy angel, Isaiah 14 verse 12. Satan's pre-fall name was probably Lucifer. Ezekiel 28 verses 12 and 14 describe Satan as not just being an a everyday angel, but, but, but an important one created as a cherubim, one of the highest created angels. He had an important role. But he became arrogant in his beauty and status and decided that he wanted to sit on the throne that God sat on. Satan's pride led to his fall. Satan then became the ruler of this world and the prince of the power of the air, Ephesians 2, verse 2. We're told that he is an accuser, and he loves to do that. He loves to do that. We'll see that in a moment, but he loves to throw accusations. And so even though he was cast out of heaven, he still seeks to elevate his throne above God. He counterfeits all that God does. He, he wants to so badly sit on the throne of God. He will counterfeit everything that God does. And he does this hoping to gain the worship of the world and encourage us to oppose God's kingdom. Satan is the ultimate source behind every idol, every false worship, every false religion, and every demon possession. He's behind it all. And we need to stop looking, stop wondering, like, is there something? Uh, no, it's him. He's behind it all. Paul talks about standing against the schemes of the devil. This is why he's telling us this, because he wants us to have the ability to stand against the schemes of the devil. Drawing from the, the vast strength, the, the immeasurable power of God to stand against the schemes of the the devil, and, and hear me, friends, he has a lot. The devil has a ton of schemes. But let me give you 
his ultimate game plan. All right? Let, let me give you his, his ultimate game plan because it hasn't changed. It's been the same. It's been the same since he fell from heaven. He has one plan and one plan only. In fact, Jesus gives it to us in John chapter 10, verse 10. H- hear the words of our Lord and Savior. He says, the thief comes only. Only. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. That's it. So every scheme that the devil has, it has one point. To steal, kill, and destroy. That's his purpose. Everything that the devil does is for this very single purpose. And he will do everything in his limited power. Friends, and he has that limited power. He does. He has this this limited power and he will use all of it to steal and kill and destroy. And so while you might think that that this little sin that you have in your life, this little sin that you are playing with, you you might be convinced, Satan might have convinced you that that it's just a tiny little thing. It's not a massive issue, right? You're going, no, 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 no. It's just, he doesn't have all of my life, but he, he does have my finances. No, he doesn't have everything. He has my relationships. He has my sexuality. He, does, he doesn't have everything. Here's the thing about Satan. He, he, he may come for just a piece in the beginning, but ultimately, he's coming for everything. Everything to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And so Paul tells us to put on the full armor of God. Knowing this, he says, well then, put on the full armor of God so that you can stand against the schemes of the devil. Friends, these are fighting words. That's what they are. They are fighting words. Paul says, with the full armor of God, you and I can face and withstand the devil and his schemes. We can. We we can stand against the rulers and the authorities of the evil unseen world, the cosmic powers of darkness, the vile spiritual forces of the heavens. We can. I know you might be sitting here and going, how? How is that possible? How? Oh, no, you've just painted this picture of this incredibly evil force. How? How can we do this? How can we stand against his schemes? How is it possible? Well, two quick reasons. There's a ton, but let me give you two. The, the, the one is because he's been defeated twice. He has. Now, I know some of you are going, oh, hold on, oh, no, I know about the cross, right? Easter Sunday is around the corner. I know that one. Wh- Where's the first one? Well, the first one was in heaven when he opposed God. Jesus makes mention of this. He talks about it. See, but the thing with us is that sometimes we read too quickly, right? We just want to get to to our favorite verses, you know? So we read really, really quickly and and we can miss it. And I think many of us have. But in Luke chapter 10, Jesus makes mention of the fact that that Satan lost in heaven. Luke chapter 10, what's going on here? Uh, Jesus sends out the disciples, 72 of them, right? He gives them clear instructions and he says, guys, I want you to go do some things. And all those things are anchored in these beautiful words. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. And so they go and they come back with great excitement and stories of success. I mean, it's been epic. It's been epic what has happened with these disciples. Uh, Look with me, verse 17 of Luke chapter 10. It says, When the 72 disciples returned, they joyfully reported to him, Lord, even the demons obey us when we use your name. Huh? But notice Jesus' response. Yes, he told them. I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. One line. Then he goes on to say, look, I've given you authority over all the power of the enemy and you can walk among snakes and scorpions and crush them. Nothing will injure you. But don't rejoice because evil spirits obey you. Rejoice because your names are registered in heaven. Rejoice that that your name is written in the book of life. What I believe Jesus is saying here, he's going, listen guys, I hear you. I hear you. That's incredible. I can see the excitement. Look, I saw Satan fall from heaven like like lightning. Like lightning. It's one of those things where if, if you weren't looking, you could miss it. That's how quick it was. He's not that impressive. When he stands before a mighty, when Satan stands before a mighty God, trust me, it's it's not like 
No, we're going to arm wrestle and we're going to see maybe you'll win, maybe you'll take it this time. No, 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 no. I, I saw him. And you can go read about it if you want to in Ezekiel chapter 28. So he fell in heaven. He lost in heaven. But then he also lost again here on earth. Jesus nailed to the cross. And he cries out, it is finished. Done. Satan lost in heaven and he lost on earth. And hear this, what Paul is about to unpack is that he continues to lose. Satan is a habitual loser. We rank up his losses when we draw on the power of God, put on the full armor of God and stand against the schemes of the devil. He, he's just ranking up the losses. This is why we're able to stand. We're standing on that truth, on that reality. Friends, you know regrets and resignations, and I know many of us have that, where we just concede defeat, even when we have not been defeated yet. We, we just kind of give up. All of that is birthed in the failure to put on the full armor of God and stand. Every single one. It's when we fail to do that. This is why Paul finds it necessary. It's important for us to know that, that we are called to put on the full armor of God. Yes, he's been defeated, but he's, man, he's crafty and he's got a lot of schemes. So verse 13 says, For this reason, take up the full armor of God so that you may be able to resist in the evil day. And having prepared everything, to take your stand. Now the next couple of verses uh, we see uh, Paul beginning to unpack uh, the various things. He, he uses a, a soldier's uniform and, and his equipment to, c to kind of unpack the things that we can use that, that will allow us to stand against the schemes of the evil one. Now, I don't want us to get lost in the illustrations. I've read commentary after commentary after commentary, and everyone says different things, and it's all great things, but, but, but they're pointing to, to the richness of what this text is about. They're pointing to the gospel and its implications. And so I don't want us to, to get lost in the illustrations, but rather see them as a guide. They're pointing us to the very important things that we need to hear. A soldier's armor becomes the vehicle for teaching us what is necessary to win the invisible yet vital battle. And so, let's walk through these. The first one, verse 14, says, Stand, therefore, that with truth like a belt around your waist. See, in Paul's day, people wore long and loose garments. Think of a tunic, which had to be bound with the belt if uh, one was to engage in vigorous activity like a battle. When a soldier was preparing for action, this was the first item of his armor that he would put on. With his belt on and his garments gathered, he could easily move around without fear of tripping. This is why I believe Paul begins with the belt of truth. See, truth holds the spiritual armor in place. Truth safeguards us against deadly entanglements. Uh, sin is a hindrance. Sin seeks to ensnare us. It trips us up, but truth protects us. And it's not just any truth, friends. It's not just any truth. It's God's truth that we need. I said this a couple of weeks ago. But by way of reminder, I'll say it again. The most dangerous word that you can put in front of truth is my. Now, I'm not saying that I don't want to hear from you. I do. But whatever you have to share, my hope is that it submits to God's truth. And so we need God's truth. John chapter 8, verse 32 says, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Only the truth will set you free. This is necessary in your battle against the schemes of the devil. The belt of truth, it's necessary. Why? 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 Why, why is it so important? Because Satan is a liar. He's a liar. That's what he does. But don't just take my word for it. Let's look at Jesus. He says in John chapter 8, verse 42 to 45, read with me. It says, Jesus told them, If God were your father, you would love me, because I have come to you from God. I am not here on my own, but he sent me. 
Why can't you understand what I'm saying? It's because you can't even hear me. For you are the children of your father, the devil. Whew. And you love to do the evil things he does. He was a murderer from the beginning. He has always hated the truth. Because there is no truth in him. When he lies, it is consistent with his character. For he is a liar and the father of lies. That is what he does. And so we need God's truth to be able to stand against those lies. Not, not, not your, your favorite Instagram quote. Not what society is saying or what's in. Or, no, 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 no. Not, not your best self-help book. No. You need God's truth. Because Satan will use all that other stuff. He will. He'll take it and he'll, he'll manipulate it and chew it up and, and then spit it back at you. Here's your lie. Back. It's an upgraded one. And so we need the belt of truth. We need God's truth. His truth matters. But Paul goes on. He says, you're also going to need righteousness like armor on your chest. Other translations say it this way, the breastplate of righteousness. See, Roman soldiers wore a tough armor tunic or sometimes a bronze breastplate to protect their vital organs like their heart from, from, from being pierced. Paul says that righteousness provides this protection in spiritual warfare. See, the enemy is coming for your heart. That's what Paul's trying to communicate to us. The enemy is coming for your heart. Another way to say it is that the enemy is coming for your identity. He's coming for your identity. He's coming for your heart. When you're telling people who you are, you're like, this is who I am. This is who I am. And he's coming for that. He wants you to doubt who you are in Christ with his lies and his deception. For those who've crossed the line of faith, he is coming for you and he's going he's gonna to make you doubt like, well, are you really a child of God? You, you, you know you. How can you call yourself a daughter of the kingdom? With that attitude, with that behavior, you, the son of the father, really, do you not remember what you did last night? You can't be. He's going to come for your identity. And it's in, in those moments that you need to remember that you have been declared righteous. You've been declared righteous. My hope is that you'd be able to, to shout out to the devil, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Now, now, do we do unrighteous things? Yes. All the time. You do unrighteous things. I do unrighteous things. Can the children of God do unrighteous things? Yes. In fact, if, if, if you want to see the frustration of this, go read Romans chapter 7, where, where Paul, you can, I mean, you, it, literally the words lift off the page. It's like he, he's wrestling with this. He's like, the things I want to do, I don't do. And the things I don't want to do, I find myself doing. Ah, who, who can save this wretched man? Like he's so frustrated. But, but hear this, what comes after Romans chapter 7? Romans, it's basic, basic mathematics. Romans chapter 8 and verse 1 goes like this. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so I get the wrestle. I go through it as well. And I hear the lies. You're not worthy. You're, you're, you're useless. I mean, you of all people, how dare you stand up on a Sunday and preach God's word? Who do you think you are? There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I have been declared righteous, not because of what I've done, but because of the finished work of Jesus. You hide that in your heart. You cover it with the breastplate of His righteousness. Because no lie 
No lie can penetrate that. Put it on. The third thing, and he says, and your feet, sandals with readiness for the gospel of peace. You see, a a Roman soldier's battle boot was an open-toed leather boot uh, tied uh, to the ankles and shins with leather straps, and and it had thick nails spread out on the soles to, to provide stability as the soldier moved forward in battle. Paul uses that as an illustration. Why? Because no soldier stands firm in the day of battle unless his morale is high. So believers, believers in Christ, we must be assured of our acceptance with God before we can stand the assaults of the evil one. We've got to be certain. And we do this by knowing our peace that comes from God, that God God gives us peace. The very fact that Jesus came is because God wants peace. Romans chapter 5, verse 1, it says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We can stand because I know I have peace with God. I also believe that this passage here is also talking about our gospel witness are sharing the good news with others. I, I believe it's, it's, it's referring to that as well. You see, our ability to share peace with others comes from the fact that peace has been shared with us. I, I cannot give you what I have not received. It's like forgiveness. I've received forgiveness from my Father in heaven. Who am I to withhold forgiveness from you? And when we read it in the Scriptures, when Jesus talks about it, it's not a suggestion. He doesn't suggest that the people of God forgive other people. It's a command. And and, and he kind of reverses it to show us how serious he is and how the gospel works in us. He goes, listen, if you don't forgive, then my Father won't forgive you. You've received peace from the Father, so give peace to others. Share the good news with others. A, A readiness to share the gospel of peace to a divided world. That is our mission as the church is that we go up those doors and we go, I'm ready. Brokenness in my family, brokenness in society, brokenness in my workplace, I have the gospel of peace and I'm ready to take it. Isaiah 52 verse 7 says this, How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of the messenger who brings good news. The good news of peace and salvation. The news that the God of Israel reigns. How beautiful. That when we do that as the church, I believe the heavens go, how beautiful is that? But here's the thing about Satan. He doesn't want us to spread the good news. No, he wants chaos and anarchy. And so he will come after our inner peace. He will come after your inner peace to keep you from sharing the peace that you've received from God. That's what he'll do. Satan loves to stir in us anxiety and worry and fear. He loves it. When you're up at night and you're wrestling and you're like, oh, I don't know, I don't know if this is possible, I don't know if things are going to come together, I don't. and, and you're, you're, you're overtaken by those things, overcome by them. He loves that because now he has you sitting there going, ah, oh, instead of being out there sharing the peace of the gospel. The devil fears and hates the gospel because it's God's power to rescue people from oppression. He hates it. He hates it. And so he will do everything in his power to keep you from experiencing the peace that comes from God. And so you put on those boots and you stand firm. It's some nice footwear to have. I'm just going to go ahead and say it. The fourth thing Verse 16, in every situation, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Now, what are the flaming arrows of the evil one? Well, there's a ton. There's a lot. There really is a lot. We could spend hour after hour after hour unpacking them. But but for the sake of time, let me give you three. Three of his flaming arrows that he loves to throw at us. And we find them in 1 John chapter 2, verse 16, where John talks about the lust of the flesh, 
the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. In fact, we see Jesus being tempted in the wilderness by Satan with the same flaming arrows. We see it. Three times Jesus is tempted. Three times Satan shoots his arrows with lies and deception, seeking to do what? Steal, kill, and destroy. Three times. But how does Jesus respond? He responds with the word. With the word. Think about this for a moment, guys. This is Jesus who is fully man, but also fully God. He, he, he didn't lose any of his godness. He could have defeated Satan the same way he was defeated in heaven. But because he did not count equality with God something to be grasped, he took on the form of a man and humbled himself. And as he was being humbled, God exalted him in his full humanity. And so what does he do? What is part of his humility? He goes, I'm just going to quote the very words I, this is Jesus, gave to Moses. How does he combat Satan's arrows with the word? Arrow one, Jesus blocks with Deuteronomy chapter eight, verse three. Comes to him because Jesus has been fasting and praying and, and he says, hey man, why don't you just turn these, uh, these uh, stones, these rocks to bread? I know you can do it. He says, no, 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 no. Man does not live on bread alone. But from every word that comes from the mouth of God. But what do we do? We're here trying to turn rocks into things, into money, into, into good circumstances, into... Se second arrow. The second arrow comes with Scripture. Jesus is, is thrown a, a arrow that, that, that now comes with a piece of Scripture. What does this tell us? Satan knows the Bible. Satan knows the Bible better than you and me. He does. And, and so, man, he, 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 he will take it and he'll manipulate it and he'll try to give it to us in such a way that it's like, that's, that's, not, that's not the truth. That's not the full truth. That, like, that's, that's a counterfeit what you're trying to present to me. This happens all the time. Th this is the one I hate the most, um, and so I'm going to go ahead and say it. Many of you know it. I know the plans I have for you. Plans to prosper you. You guys know it, right? All of, and, and, and we hear it quoted all the time. Now, it's God's word, and so because it's God's word, it's true, but, but you can't just pull it out. Like It's like a smash and grab. It's like, I'm just going to grab this one, and I'm going to go with it. Satan loves that. We, we fail to recognize that, that many of the promises in God's word, they, they, they're there and they are yes in Christ. But, but many of them, they, there is a command that comes before the promise. Satan will have you believe, no, you, you can just skip over that. You don't have to be obedient. Look at, just get the promise. That's a smash and grab, friends. And then, and then Satan will have you feasting on that, believing that all of this is from God. No, it's not. Remember, he has limited power. Limited power. And he will, use, he will do everything in his limited power, even use God's word against you. Jesus blocks with Deuteronomy 6, 16. Don't test God, Jesus says. The third arrow, Jesus blocks with Deuteronomy 6, 13. You know, he's like, oh, I'll give you everything, every kingdom you've ever wanted. I'll give you. No, 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 no. G Jesus knows how the story ends. I, I get every kingdom. I get the crown. I get J Jesus is like, I get to wear the crown, but you, you cannot get to the crown without going through the cross. Many of us, we, we, like, the fact that we get to share glory with Jesus one day, but you've got to go through the cross. Satan will try to get you to skip that thing. The shield of faith. See, our shield of faith is our trust in God and His Word. It's our trust in God and His Word. And we must know it. We must know it. You see, but for many of us, we don't. And because we don't, we shouldn't be surprised when the fiery arrows hit us and we become inflamed with the sinful passions of this world. The enemy knows you. He, he knows your temptations. He knows your weaknesses. He knows your idols. He, he knows the things that so easily ensnare you. 
Satan has been doing the stealing, killing, and destroying thing for a very long time. He's been doing it since Genesis chapter 3. He's a pro at this. How long have you been alive? To think that your own strength is what will get you through this is, is foolishness. Satan whispers lie after lie after lie after lie after lie after lie. That's what he does. James chapter 1 verse 14 to 15 says, Temptation comes from our own desires which entice us and drag us away. These desires give birth to sinful actions and when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. That's what we do. We feed, we feed us because it's a tiny little thing, right? It's, a, it's not, it's, oh, come on, man. It's just a, it's just a behavioral thing. It's not that big of an issue. It's just my sin. It, it doesn't impact everyone else. It's just me, right? And so you just keep feeding it and feeding it and feeding it and feeding it and feeding it. And before you know it, you smell like death. And because you, you know that, you try to cover it up with pretending and performing. Which is another scheme of the devil. You're just playing into his hand. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. That's your payment for what you do. It's death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Friends, the word of God contains the promises of God, which are given to us to face any and every situation. Friends, this is why I love the word of God. I love this. And my hope, my prayer, every Sunday when I show up here is that you would love the word of God. That you, that you want to immerse yourself in it. Because in here contains God's promises to us that are yes in Christ. Promises of mercy and compassion, of help, strength, endurance, forgiveness, comfort, guidance, abundant life. Yes, even in this life. An eternal reward. Why, why would you go anywhere else? For each of our needs, there is a promise from God that is certain to be kept. And we, in obedience, lift our faith in God's promises and they shield us from all spiritual attacks. I, I, like, I have nothing else for you. Like, I, 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 do I have some good ideas? I do. Honor, are you good at strategy? Oh, I think I'm one of the best. Humble brag. <laughs> but that's not what you need. You need the word of God. And that's why Sunday in and Sunday out, we'll just get up here and we'll open it and we'll go, here's what God says. He says, take the helmet of salvation. See, the helmet pr protects the head. I believe here Paul is concerned about our mental clarity, specifically when, when we question our salvation. Because I know all of us at some point in our lives we have. Some of us just do it more than others. But at some point, we've questioned our salvation. We've wondered, like, man, am I really saved? I, it might be because, you know, you, you, you are confessing this particular sin for the hundredth time to God when the last time you came to him and you were like, I'm never going to do this again. We've all been there. And so now you're going, you know what, like, is this even worth it anymore? Like you look at other people and you're like, but, the, but he's doing the same thing and look how, how he's like, like he's got the car he wants, the house he wants, like things are going, they look like they're going well, but re, like this salvation, th I don't even know, I don't even know, I, I, maybe I'm, gonna, I'm just going to check out. We've all questioned our salvation at some point and Satan loves it when we're in this place. We're so vulnerable when we're in this place. We begin to doubt that God can and will save us until the end. See, when we live in this doubt, we become timid and weak. That's what happens. Again, because, you know, our church, highly competent, highly educated, people doing amazing things, and, and so we never want to appear timid and weak, and so what do we do? We just pretend. Even though that's how I feel. You, you wake up on a Sunday, and you, you, I mean, you just you feel like, what's the point of life? But you're like, well, I've got to show up to Rooted Fellowship, and I need to make sure everyone sees me, you know? How's everything? Fantastic. Oh, things are going great. I love my life. 
No, you don't. I saw your Instagram post. You don't. You're more truthful over there than you are here. Satan loves us in this place because we become timid and weak. But we know that that is not true because it is written, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of, of power and love and self-discipline. That is who we are. And so sometimes we just need to grab one another and go, Soldier, stand. This spirit of fear is not you. You have been given a spirit of love, of power, and of self-discipline. We're so used to the whispers of Satan that that's kind of how we respond sometimes. Even with God's word, we'll whisper, it's like, I'm going to give you a spirit of power and love. Even when we sing sometimes, it's like, I wonder if, 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 if the, the folks up here, like, like, I wonder if they go, do these people believe what they're singing? God, you mighty battle and power and grace. Like, that's not a battle. No one goes into battle like that. Oh, but I'm a secret agent. No, you're not. <laughs> you're not. You've believed the lie so much that now, because he whispers to you, you go, I'll just whisper back. Instead of making a declaration. For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity. But of power and love and self-discipline. Some of us, we, we're uncomfortable. I know that. We're uncomfortable. Man, this black guy seems angry. No, I'm not. I know some of us, like, we, we need to hear it loud. We need to hear it over and over and over again. Because the sin in our life has gotten so deep in our hearts. He's forgiven you, and he, he does that once. That's how powerful the blood of Jesus is. So, so we don't confess our sins because it's like, oh, I don't know if he's forgiven me or not. I don't. No, when he says, you're in, you're in. Forgiveness is a decision, done. But we confess our sins because some of those things are so, <laughs> are so deep. We did a series on this uh, last year, Emotionally Healthy Spiritual Discipleship, where we spoke about generational sin and generational curses. It's deep in you. Some of you guys are wondering, I don't even know why I like it. I, I, I don't even know where it comes from. You know what I mean? Like, I've never been around that, but, but, but when I see it, when I, like, there's this thing in me. What is it? That sin goes deeper than you think. And so some of us need to be crying out these verses way more than we are. Stand, soldier. See, with this helmet, we can throw ourselves into whatever God has called us to. We've got the helmet of salvation. We can go wherever he calls us. We can do whatever he calls us to do. A and hear this, friends, because I know sometimes we, we, we look at the standards of the world and the metrics of success of the world and we, we say that, that they apply to the kingdom of God. No, they don't. They don't. Go read Hebrews chapter 11. And I know many of you love that, that chapter. It's a great chapter. Many of our heroes are there all doing epic and amazing things. By faith, they did this. By faith, you're just like, wow, I want to be one of those people. I want to close the mouths of lions, step on, on fire. I want to do it all. B but I'd encourage you to keep reading. Keep reading. Because in there we're told about those who were torn in two, burnt alive, stoned to death. A and, then, and then the writer of Hebrews goes, no, 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 but I'm still commending them for their faith. The kingdom of God... Its, its standards are completely different to the standards of this world. And so we put on the helmet of salvation and we go, if God's calling us there, then we go. I, I said this in the first gathering um, and my wife was sitting up front and, uh, and she quietly rebuked me, um, but I understood what she meant and so I'm going to say it and then I'm going to rebuke myself as if she was sitting here. <laughs> so I, I said this, fr friends, we're, we're moving Next week, Sunday, Easter Sunday, can't wait. New Hope School. It's going to be epic. It's going to be incredible. One gathering. We'll be able to do this, all of us together. 9.15, don't be late. But if the school burns down, we, we don't go, oh, God, I guess Rooted Fellowship is an absolute failure. No, it's not. The kingdom of God still advances. We still win. We still win. Why? Because God wins. Because God wins. And so, 
We put on the helmet of salvation and we go. And then finally, we're told that we're to get the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. I love that. In case, in case you, you were wondering if there's a theme here, there is. Paul does have a clear theme. Trust God and His Word. He uses a ton of illustrations, and I know many of us, we get caught up in them, right? And we start like all these massive descriptions, and, and we start coloring. It. It's, it's, it's great, it's great. But the theme here is trust God and His Word. And we're told to get the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now, up until now, all the armor that Paul has given us has been tools of defense. But now we get one of both defense and attack. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Is the Word of God important? Yes. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 says this. For the Word of God is living and effective and sharper than any double-edged sword, penetrating as far as the separation of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It is able to judge. Other translations say discern the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. If you're trying to figure out, man, what are the intentions of my heart? Just pick up this word and start reading it. Just start reading it and just keep reading and just keep reading. And like just keep prayfully read through it. Put on some, some, some music and, and just keep reading and keep reading. Trust me, the Holy Spirit will reveal to you the intentions of your heart. Satan is a liar but so are we. And we're really good at it. I'd been lying to myself for almost 19 years of my life before I had an encounter with Jesus, a real encounter with Jesus. So I'm pretty, I'm pretty good at it. The Word discerns and it judges. It examines our hearts. Examine me, O Lord. So, some of us don't even want to say that because we realize like, um... Maybe examine them, oh Lord. <laughs> and you'll see in the text, Paul says it's the sword of the Spirit. It's the sword of the Spirit because it is the Spirit who has given it to God's people. It's the Holy Spirit that gives God's Word to God's people. The Bible is God's word inspired by the Holy Spirit. Uh, look, look at what Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20 to 21. He says, Above all, you must realize that no prophecy in Scripture ever came from the prophet's own understanding or from human initiative. No, Peter says. Those prophets were moved by the Holy Spirit and they spoke from God. The Christian Standard Bible says it this way. Instead, men spoke from God as they were being carried along by the Holy Spirit. They had to be carried by the Holy Spirit as well. Now, now, I know that there are many tribes who, who will go, no, 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 it's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Scriptures. Failing to recognize that it's the Holy Spirit that gives the Scriptures. It is the Holy Spirit who regenerates, who transforms us so that we can believe the Bible. It is the Holy Spirit who illuminates, who helps us interpret so that we can understand God's Word. And the Holy Spirit gives the power to make Scripture effective in battle. Don't sideline the Holy Spirit. Maybe a better way to say it is don't try to sideline the Holy Spirit because we can't sideline Him. To use biblical language, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Titus chapter 3 verse 4 and 7 says, When God, our Savior, this is our Father, revealed His kindness and love, it's because it's the Father's love and kindness that leads to repentance. He saved us not because of the righteous things we had done, because we, we don't have any. We have nothing. We have nothing to offer. But because of His mercy, He washed away our sins, giving us a new birth and new life through the Holy Spirit. He generously poured out the Spirit upon us through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Sometimes people will go, oh, no, you always talk about generosity. Why must we be a generous people? Because we have generously received Because of this grace, he made us right in his sight and gave us confidence that we will inherit eternal life. You see, to fight with God's word is to fight with the Spirit's power. To fight with the Spirit's power is to fight with the Scriptures. And if it was good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for us. Put on the full armor of God. Put it on. Put it on. 
Paul then closes by encouraging us to pray. He hasn't stopped talking about our ability to withstand the schemes of the day. He hasn't. He, he, he's now adding on. He's like, now you've got the full armor of God, but now I want to give you a secret weapon, a weapon that Satan doesn't always see coming. He encourages us to pray. And, and here's why I believe it's a secret weapon. Here's why I believe that Satan doesn't always see it coming. It's because he doesn't expect us to pray. I mean, we say it all the time, right? Yeah, I'll, pr I'll, I'll pray for you. And then when you see that person again the following week, you're like, oh, ish, I said, quickly, Father God, thank you so much for that person. And let the, give them everything that they need. Hey, bud, yeah, yeah, I prayed for you, huh? Been, yeah, I've been praying for you. And, and some of us will, will, will come with those, look, uh, uh, we need to pray with boldness. He's been defeated. Our king is victorious. Pray with boldness. So Satan doesn't expect us to pray. And for those who do pray, I think many of us, we don't really understand why we pray. I think, we, we, yeah, yeah, it's to ask God for things. When we must make our requests known to him. God loves to hear from his children. Right? I'm a father of two. I love to hear from my kids. Uh, even some of the like, weird stuff that I'm like, no, there's no ways we're going to, I want to get a cell phone. Yeah, that'll never happen. That'll never happen. But just the mere fact that you believe I can do it, I mean, that's incredible. That's what, like God wants that from his children. But, but more important than just requests, you know what prayer is? Prayer is recognizing that we are not in control. And the problem is that we wait until it's too late. You know you can pray that you're not in control even though things are going well? Just recognizing that, you know, it's, it's my sovereign father who's seated on his throne who gives me these things. On a great idea. Oh, thanks. I really appreciate that. But to be honest, it's actually not my idea. It uh, it's, was given to me by my father. He gave me this brain that actually works. Sometimes my wife thinks it doesn't, but it, it, it does. And so we pray, he gives us a secret weapon, and he tells us that we're to pray all times. When should we pray? All times. How often? All times. You know what the, the Greek is for all times? All times. <laughs> pray at all times in the Spirit with every prayer and request, and stay alert with all perseverance and intercession for all the saints. M Matthew chapter 26, verse 41 says, Keep watch, be alert. And pray so that you will not give into temptation. Why, why the seriousness of, of, of these words? Why? why? First Peter chapter 5, verse 8 and 9. It says, stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. You see, we don't believe that. We just kind of read over it. But, but, but if I was to tell you now, Someone ran in and said, hey, guys, um, a lion has just escaped from Pretoria Zoo. And not just any lion. Man, the fiercest one. They, they couldn't contain that one. To be honest, I don't know why we have zoos. Um, <laughs> but that's a conversation for another day. So, so this lion has escaped. And, 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 and it's, looking, it's looking for someone who looks like you. It is dressed exactly like you. He's, he, he, he's looking for, for, for someone who exactly like you. It's, it's, like, it's almost like he, he looked at you before he left. And now he's in hot pursuit. I'm, t I'm telling you, how you leave this building would be different. It would. You'd be walking out here going. Every sound that sounds like a lion, you'd be like. But we don't. Many of us are just, we're skipping along, and it's like, oh, this is a great sermon on it. Woo! Easter Sunday, yes, new building, can't wait. What's it like? Head down. You don't even, you're not even concerned with what's going on. That, that's not the word of the Bible. It says stay alert. Keep watch. Be on guard. Because the devil is after you. Stand firm against him and be strong in your faith. Friends, this isn't a game. Satan doesn't consider it a game. I've never seen anyone try to negotiate with a lion. But here we are doing it all the time. It's like we're playing dice with the lion. Like, hey. 
if we want to be a part of what God is doing, we've got to put on the full armor of God. Otherwise, Satan will wipe us out, and he loves to do that. And I get it. Some of us, who we, we've crossed the line of faith, and so once we are in the Father's hands, we will never be snatched. That's a promise from God's word. So he can't get us that way. But what he will do is attempt to keep us from enjoying all that God has for us. He will try to make sure that any influence, any kingdom influence that you have where you live, work, and play, that he will snuff that out. And he loves to do it. How many influential churches do we know where we hear that the leaders ended up living in, 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 a, in a sinful way and hiding this and covering it up. And, and, and now you've got people walking around going, yes, yeah, I don't, man, that's why I don't believe in the church. Yeah, that's why I don't give. That's, that's, that's why I don't trust this. This, 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 uh, this is a white man's religion. That's a scheme of the devil. So stay alert. Be on guard. Keep watch. I'm going to call the band up. I'm going to close out here. Because pa Paul closes this portion of scripture by asking for the church to pray for him. He asks, pray for me. With everything that I've said, please pray for me. Pray that I would put on the full armor of God. But I'm also praying for you. I'm praying that you would also put on the full armor of God. And he, and he asks for these prayers, recognizing that this is a community effort. You've been beautifully designed for fellowship. We need one another. I need you to pray for me. I hope you are. Y you, know when, you know when I need your prayers the most? Saturday night. As I'm sitting and immersing myself in the word and saying, God, what is it that you have for me and for us? I need your prayers like you cannot believe because that's when he's coming and in my ear the whole time. Who do you think you are? You didn't study you didn't do enough. You're a loser. They're going to criticize you. They're going to tell you that it was horrible. They're going to say that it was a little bit too long and a little bit too this. and a I, I, know, I know. I know. But I, the problem is when I believe it. And so pray. Pray for one another. Pray for one another. And so I'll close by praying for all of you. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it is living and active, that it continues to transform the individual lives of people. It brings them from death to life, from darkness to light, from being an orphan to now being a child. And so God, would you do a work that only you can do right here in this place? People are in desperate need of healing. Would you heal them? physically, spiritually, emotionally, mentally, you are well able to do that. Would you restore folks who need restoration? They've believed the lie over and over and over again. But would you declare over them that they are your children and that nothing can separate them from your love? You will never leave us or abandon us. And many of us are in need of reconciliation. Some just need to be reconciled to you that we haven't crossed the line of faith we're sitting here and we're listening to these words and we know we don't have a relationship with you but we just tell people that we do so they can get off our backs God, I pray I pray I pray that in this moment you would pierce into our cold stone hearts and redeem us reconcile us back to the Father and then reconcile us to one another we're in desperate need of a Savior. We ask all of this in Jesus' name.